the British Isles of the mid-17th century saw a long period of conflict collectively known as the English Civil Wars. Fought primarily between the King and Parliament, their repercussions are felt right down to the present day. One of the most significant figures of the English Civil War period was this man, Sir Ralph Hopton, later First Baron Hopton. A member of Parliament with conflicted loyalties, he would eventually declare for the King, proving himself an able Royalist military commander, although ultimately outfoxed and outfought on the battlefield. In 2020, I discovered this previously unknown 17th century document, which I believed had a connection to Sir Ralph Hopton. In my next video, I will tell the story of my research and what I discovered. This time, however, I would like to begin by telling Sir Ralph Hopton's own story. Ralph Hopton was born in Witham Friary in the county of Somerset in 1596, the eldest child of Robert and Jane Hopton. The Hoptons were a prominent family and significant landowners, and we'll look at that aspect a little more closely in my next video. Growing up, Ralph attended Lincoln College, Oxford for a time, and later studied law in London. Ralph's first military experience came in 1620, when he was part of an English force that fought in support of the Protestant King and Queen of Bohemia. The Queen was none other than Elizabeth Stuart, daughter of the English King James I, who was also James VI of Scotland. The campaign failed, although the King and Queen were successfully rescued. During these events, Ralph developed a very close friendship with this man, William Waller, one of his fellow soldiers. Their friendship would become one of the great tragedies of the later English Civil War, and we'll look at that more closely later in this video. In 1623, Ralph married a young widow named Elizabeth Capel. Theirs appears to have been a genuinely affectionate marriage, as can be seen in this portrait of them from 1637. Sadly, she died in 1646, and the couple were childless. Ralph's life during the 20-year period prior to the outbreak of the First Civil War in 1642 appears very complicated. He had spells both as a soldier and as a Member of Parliament, where he represented numerous different constituencies. His conflicted loyalties became self-evident during those final tense months before the war broke out. For example, in 1641 he sided with Parliament in their grand remonstrance against the King, Charles I, while shortly afterwards he supported the King in his attempt to arrest five members of Parliament. This was Charles I's infamous attempt at a coup d'etat that finally pushed the country into civil war. As both sides set about raising armies, Hopton was appointed the Commissioner of Array for Somerset, meaning he was in charge of raising and preparing troops there. However, the county was dominated by Parliament, and Hopton found himself in Dorset when the King raised his standard at Nottingham on the 22nd of August, 1642. Eventually, Hopton was able to link up with other Royalist forces in Cornwall, most notably those under the command of Sir Beville Grenville. In the first half of 1643, they began to turn the tide in the West Country, with Royalist victories at Braddock Down and Stratton. I mentioned earlier about the tragedy of Hopton's friendship with Sir William Waller, and this is the period where that occurred. They weren't just fighting on opposite sides in a civil war, they were actually fighting each other in the same theatre, as Waller had been made a Major General by Parliament and given command of the Western Association Army. Despite the severity of the fighting, the two men maintained their personal affection for each other, and Wallace sent Hopton a letter which has become one of the most famous from the Civil War period. It includes an often quoted passage which encapsulates the tragedy of men from the same country fighting each other. Waller wrote, That great God, who is the searcher of my heart, knows with what a sad sense I go upon this service and with what a perfect hatred I detest this war without an enemy. After those royalist victories in Cornwall, at Braddock Down, and then Stratton, 
the next major engagement would take place here, at Lansdowne in Somerset, on the 5th of July. Hopton and Waller would go head to head in what proved to be an indecisive battle, but one in which Sir Beverell Grenville was killed. Events now moved very quickly, with the Royalists consolidating their forces in the West Country. Hopton linked up his troops with those under the command of this man, Prince Maurice, who was Prince Palatine of the Rhine. And so, just eight days after the Battle of Lansdowne, Hopton engaged Waller once again, this time at Roundway Down in Wiltshire on the 13th of July. The Western Association army was routed, and the Royalists achieved their biggest military success of the war. This was also Ralph Hopton's personal high point. He was now the principal commander of Royalist forces in the West, and he was made First Baron Hopton of Stratton, in recognition of his earlier military success. The Royalists now had an opportunity to seize the initiative, and a plan was hatched for the King's nephew, the flamboyant Prince Rupert, to lead an advance on London, whilst Hopton would take his troops into Hampshire and Sussex, in an attempt to cut off one of Parliament's main sources of armament manufacture. Hopton successfully entered Hampshire, but by the end of 1643 was unable to advance any further than Winchester. In March the following year, he met the Parliamentarians in battle at the nearby village of Cheriton, and suffered a heavy defeat. It was the beginning of a downward slope for Hopton, and indeed the whole Royalist campaign. More battles were to follow, but Hopton's would be an increase in the administrative rather than practical role. After the crushing Royalist defeat at Naseby in June 1645, the Western Army became the last remaining significant Royalist field force. With Parliament's military reforms having created the brilliant and professional New Model Army, they quickly followed up their victory at Naseby with another one at Langport in Somerset in July of 1645. The Royalists were becoming increasingly scattered and fragmentary. Much of the blame for the defeat of the Royalist forces at Langport justifiably fell on their leader, Lord Goring. He resigned, and command passed once more to Ralph Hopton to try to salvage something from the ashes. Running out of options, territory and troops, Hopton withdrew to Torrington in Devon, and made a defensive stand there. But parliamentarian forces arrived on the 16th of February 1646, and after a short but sharp battle, inflicted another crushing defeat on the Royalists. Throughout this period, Hopton had been up against one of the greatest military commanders of the Civil War, Sir Thomas Fairfax. After the victory at Torrington, he pursued Hopton as far as Truro in Cornwall, and there, on the 12th of March, 1646, Hopton surrendered, as the First Civil War drew to a close, with victory for Parliament. Like many prominent royalists, Ralph Hopton went into exile. For some time he was an advisor to the Prince of Wales, the future Charles II, particularly during the period of the Second Civil War, but their relationship eventually ended in disagreements. With the Second Civil War over, and Charles I executed, Parliament formed the Commonwealth, and England became a republic. Still in exile in Bruges in modern-day Belgium, Ralph Hopton died in September 1652. Following the restoration of 1660, Hopton's body was repatriated to England, and reburied at the Church of St Mary, in the village of his birth, Witham Friary in Somerset. His confiscated estates were restored to his family, but, being childless, they passed to his nephew, Thomas Wyndham. As I mentioned earlier, in part two, we'll look at the research, history and contents of this 17th century document, which has a connection to Ralph Hopton. Also, if you'd like to know more about the English Civil War period, and in particular the life of this man, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector, why not take a look at the Cromwell Museum's website? The address is on the screen now, and a link can also be found in the description field for this video. You can also visit the museum in person, 
and the opening times can be found on the website. It's located in Huntingdon in Cambridgeshire, in the very building that used to house the grammar school that Oliver Cromwell himself attended. The museum provided me with invaluable assistance for my document research, and I will also be talking more about that next time. For now, if you've enjoyed this video, please press the like, subscribe, and notification bell buttons. Thank you very much indeed for watching, and I'll see you again next time.